Oye, Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, dear panelists, for coming. Um, this is a session, Oscar? Okay. This is a session uh, in which we're going to present different projects uh, regarding collective action. Um, I'm going to present, first of all, Ramon. He's from WIFINET. He will explain to us what is WIFINET, this collective infrastructure. Uh, around the accessibility of internet. Fogdoni, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Fogdoni or Fogdoni? You can, you can correct me, okay, later. His Pau, Fogdoni uh, is a tool uh, that helps uh, facilitate uh, voting and collective participation. Walter, he's the, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce correctly your surname. Walter, Walter Trebens, Trebens, well, sorry. Thank you. He's going to present two projects. Uh, he's the alternative to Google, so make sure that you get the URL <laughs> of his project. Uh, we've got here Olivier Schuben. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, presenting here Platonic. Uh, Platonic is a company that helps uh, other organizations uh, through agile methodologies uh, to achieve the best participation processes as possible. Uh, and we've got here Adriana. She's got many, Adriana Freitas, she's got many hats, but right now she's going to present us the, the Data Beers project in Barcelona. So we're going to start with Adriana. Uh, Stay thank tuned. You. Uh, my voice is almost none, so I will try my best to explain. Uh, Data Beers is what is written here, is basically an idea about creating communities. Uh, and the only thing you need is to like uh, data and, and present projects in data and doesn't have any vertical, it's totally open. And, uh, and maybe because of this sense of community that make us grow. It truly started uh, in 2014 when uh, we, I wrote a post uh, where data was the backbone of uh, a smart city. And then I touch on the point, like, you know, how much Barcelona on that time, so those numbers are like from 2014, how much Barcelona was to be an amazing city, and uh, also the inspiration that people have between design studios and data visualization, and also the fact that, you know, we had here the creativity from Gaudi and all the masters, and at the same time, the, 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 the leadership being created in the city with the MBAs. On 2014, we had the creation of 120 startups just on that year related to data. So that was like an outrageous point for that. And touching about the city, it was exactly when people were thinking about how much data in a city can be used in a profitable way and how much like using the data in the right way to better decisions and more effective can truly reduce the cost for things for citizens. And from that point, we created uh, Data Beers that was basically uh, uh, to become a beacon of discussion around machine learning, data visualization, journalism, data visualization for journalism, and data analytics. Uh, we are not alone. After Barcelona got created, more other 29 other cities are. The last one is Rioja, that has an event on the 21st of November. So it's, it's been growing and growing. And that abyss is nothing, uh, uh, anything unique. Uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, anyone can speak, and it's basically seven minutes talk. So the passion for what you do is very important to have there. Otherwise, you'll not be able to speak. So it beers, talks, and then beers. And, uh, and then anyone can speak. Uh, so we did already 19 events and more than we have all in video and uh, a lot of companies being represented. 
and we are proud of ourselves to be one of the technology events that has a big uh, ratio of women attending. Uh, we we talk about like you know many things, uh, ecosystem adventures, family feeling when we see other projects from Barcelona going abroad, uh, design driven by data, humanity centered design driven by data, data responsibility. And the last one we touched about was like on data safety. And uh, we're basically uh, taking into account the Asilomar principle that was analyzed about like, you know, how AI could hurt society. But uh, we, we are here and uh, we look for help and we also think we can help. And uh, our next event is on the 3rd of December. So this is like just for have a view. We have like four speakers already. We're going to have uh, machine learning for social good. Uh, we're going to have Down Jones talking about uh, money, money laundry. Uh, we have like uh, uh, people doing like uh, deep learning for uh, matching and uh, GPS is also. So these very uh, uh, different uh, topics. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. The next one, Olivia. Okay, so while the slides appear on the screen, hopefully they're there. Uh, so first of all, I will speak about uh, collective action. So we do develop uh, tools, but I will really focus on what I, we call um, digital transition. So how can we make sure that we have people participating offline and online? Um, and that's more complex than it seems. So we have like beautiful infrastructures in this panel, so I won't speak that much about it, and I will speak about a, a platform we've been developing in the next session, so that's why I don't want to bother you with this type of uh, details. Okay, so basically you have heard about like, uh, participation is a, is a buzzword these days. Probably you have heard about the Convention Citoyenne, which is basically a sorted participatory process where 100 citizens have been sorted out in, in France and they decide on policy making on climate change. So, sortition, uh, consultations, participatory budgets, all these schemes are really happening these days. So we have platforms for that, but what we're missing is like capacity building and make sure that people participating offline have a reason and incentives to keep on working online. All right, it would be better to have pictures to, uh, to show that. Yeah, sorry about that. But anyway, I'm trying to follow the, 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 the original scenarios. So I have my computer. If you want, I stop talking and I, I plug my computer in there. All right? Because what I want to show you is like how really we need to rethink of the design of the participatory spaces we use offline. Right? And this, the design of these spaces need to make sure that it ensures uh, the transition to participatory digital platforms. Sorry, sorry, Olivier. Oh, yeah, that's just my ID. Who cares? You know, it's like, this, this, this is about like reading my ID, so I don't really need paper in that case. Good point. That was made of purpose. Um, so basically, yes. So that's uh, basically what we know about sortition. And I'll basically talk about tools for urban collaborative governance today and how they, they, they need to be uh, basically hybrid. So let's make sure we... Sorry about that. I don't know if it's what would be easier. All right. So this is the type of uh, events we're organizing. So this is basically a, uh, an, an event, kind of a hack camp. It's called, uh, if you can. Uh, so it's, it's an event we've done. The last one was in Madrid. So it's basically 50 projects between uh, uh, 100 participants. Uh, let, let's come back to this. Um, and basically, what we, usually what we have at the end is just like this type of output. So we have like a post-its just like here. So how, how, you know, we need some people like, who are responsible to translate all this and then interpret. You know, people have, you know, that we have human uh, writing, so that's basically complicated to, you know, we have a real challenge, which is basically how do we make up data and analysis and impact on what is happening in this type of spaces, right? So basically what we really work on is like make sure that we have this connection with digital tools. So that's kind of an example. It's not appearing now because it's very slow. Uh, so we have built some tools which basically allow what kind of a new figure we call like uh, data takers, which are basically 
digital storytellers who allows all the participants who have a real conversation without having like horizontality in between them, not feeling being at school in a hack camp and someone is responsible to taking the notes and make sure that these notes are tracked to the, the number of the participants. So basically the participants have also a dashboard online and they make like the di digital di digestion. So it's basically combining the power of collective action moments uh, and making sure that this peak of community activities are, are also at this time for personal and individual or at least in an internal uh, uh, process in an organization of digestion. So this is basically what you see here. Uh, all the methodology we've been developing are online, so you can find them on the Watify website, watify.eu. We're building also like uh, beautiful open source platforms, and I'm talking about that in the next session, so I'm inviting you to stay in the next session. Uh, we're also working together, uh, we have worked with the, you know, the two main uh, cities who are like pro producing uh, impact on uh, direct democracy, which is basically Madrid. Well, now they have a problem, a real one, uh, and they see him. All right, so we work with both, with both uh, platforms, improving citizen engagement. So basically, that's basically where we the, the make the best impact. And I can't speak louder, otherwise it's just like makes it All right, so if you think about that, what is happening here, we have a very bad quality of uh, audience on, on having a dialogue acoustically. So that's basically, we also need to take care of how these spaces are designed. And it's exactly what's happening on platforms. We don't understand each other. We have these beautiful tools, but it's still, you know, so we need more empathy on the platforms too. So basically, DCDM and Consul behind DCD Madrid, they have a problem, which is basically user experience. All right, so they are designed with the mindset of institutions. So the citizens, institutions want citizens to just fill the boxes. So it makes easy the work of institutions to digest and make beautiful reports out of it. But it's absolutely not talking, and I have no relation, relation with how I'm, uh, I'm experiencing activism in my own organization or, or by you know, using Tsunami Democratic. So we just basically need to learn from what's happening outside of these institutional schemes. So what, this is basically what we try to do, uh, developing a sub-products of, uh, of the Consul platform, which is basically uh, uh, trying to encourage citizen engagements around citizen, pro uh, citizen proposals, which is basically a scheme of participation where citizen proposals to change the, or influence the politics in their city needs to raise or kind of, uh, yes, 1% uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the census in the city. So in Madrid, a citizen uh, uh, initiative would have to basically collect 21,000 signatures, which is basically almost impossible. For, for NGO or for a civic uh, lobby to, to, so that they need tools to start with. And it's basically where we apply gamification. Basically, that's the message to these platforms are very, very simple. We just need the platform to be able to understand citizens and talk with them. And that doesn't mean always in artificial intelligence. That basically means looking at the GDPR laws and basically know what the, the, the how the, these institutional platforms can talk. So don't be afraid if you're an institution you need to give feedback to people participating. Otherwise, you have like a zombie of participation. They're really like having a big, 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 like, um, how do you call that? Involvement, and then they got no answer. So, and they have no, no, no way to connect with the other citizens' proposals. They have no way to work together, to be the lobby together. So, uh, I, I don't have time to go, you know, in details. But basically, if you have a, such an objective for a citizen uh, initiatives, which is basically 27,000 supports to raise, you need basically to divide this roadmap into very sm small thresholds and you make sure that these citizens' uh, um, uh, initiatives reach and get incentives in each step. So basically what we have done is a dashboard. It's basically like, like going at the gym. When you do jogging, it's exactly the same. So I know how many signatures I'm raising. I know who I should connect to uh, to get more uh, influence. And also each time I get to this threshold, I have a uh, kind of resources which are unblocked, just like in games. That's very important to say. And the most sexy, let's say, but now it's not possible anymore in, because the political power have changed in Madrid. But let's say the, the best incentives I see is like citizens' assemblies, so citizen cherries. Let's see, for, if you look at the city of Madrid in that week, that the most voted, uh, basically the most voted citizen proposal would go on citizen jury, right? This is just beautiful. It doesn't look like it, but it's, it's amazing. I uh, don't know if I have time to talk about that. I just need two minutes. I will go very, very, very fast. And if you're interested in it, just let me know. So basically, we're working also with, uh, closely with, with Decidim, uh, which is a platform uh, which, which uh, is born here in Barcelona. But 
what I like to say, you know, you should help us and you sh we should help citizens to bring all these platforms, this idiom is one of them, to the third dimension. The third dimension means basically to the dimension of activism we are experiencing, not the institutional one. All right, so basically, just as an example, we are applying this idiom to urban governance of uh, basically like old industrial heritage buildings, which are run by citizens under a CIS uh, uh, scheme for, for 50 years, and that is really the moment to create like this participatory process. And then we have a uh, multiple decidim which are connected together in various cities. That's interesting. I don't have that much time. Uh, so Rome. So that's interesting. Not only in cities, also like citizen moving to the to to the countryside. That's interesting. So this, you see a, an old building there, and basically this implies you need an all new experience in this platform. So basically people need to recognize the building they will live in, and this actually decidim exper user experience doesn't give them. So it's as simple as like giving them an idea of where the participatory processes are happening. So if we need to build like this. 10 blocks of buildings, we need to start somewhere. So the participatory pro process starts with recognizing the space you're deciding about and then entering the process, and then you're on the platform. Uh, actually, I don't know if you know the experience of Conbatlo, which is amazing. Uh, they just obtained a leasehold for 50 years from the Citizen Council, which is basically based on an analysis which was done manually, which is says, let's count uh, hours of voluntary, w voluntary work and then make an equivalency with uh, the salaries of, of municipal technicians and then we have a very, very simple uh, calculation, which is basically citizens are spending five millions to run that space. So here are the keys, because that's much cheaper than what we pay for uh, actually the, the, the municipality technicians. And so we, we just like the last thing, I'm sw I swear, we're building for the decidim environment uh, um, a whole new module, which is uh, about measuring this voluntary impact. So I just give you an example. It's of course voluntary, so you need uh, to accept that you're, you know, you're, you're uh, how do you call that? You're measuring your time, so you have to log in and log out. And basically, at the time that they, they, they're painting these for the manifestation, they just take pictures of it, and then we also have like real, let's say, like a track of what has been uh, happening. Basically, when we talk about like buildings and renovations, we need to make sure that the volunteers are doing a, a work which is visible. So this is basically about calculating economically and also uh, under the social impact scheme, the impact of participation in, in that case in, co in governance of buildings, which is much more concrete than what uh, the city uh, makes on the a, on a level of a city. So I'm I'm going to talk to you about the Things Network Catalonia. And uh, we have the very pleasant situation that the, one of the founders from Amsterdam is with us this morning, Wienke Giesemann. Can I have an applause for Wienke? In 2015, in the summer, they got together 10 organizations in Amsterdam to put a LoRa 1 antenna on their building and share it as a community network. That was the starting point. And they decided to publish a manifest where they said, everything that we do as network will be open source and everybody can participate. It will be under free licenses. And that's basically the starting point where several cities started to replicate. Now, I'm not sure, it's about 1,000 um, uh, uh, cities around the world, around 100,000 people participating, or maybe 80,000. Vinke, how much is it? 80,000, sorry. <clears throat> this is the other presentation. The other one. So uh, we started here in the beginning of 2016 uh, to form a, uh, a community locally in Barcelona and surroundings. Uh, the Things Network Catalonia grew out from that. Uh, what, we, um, what we decided is to follow the example of Amsterdam and People started to put gateways, antennas, uh, and sh send the data to the shared network server so that people could connect their sensors and recover their data, which is encrypted, and then from the web backend, recover that data and use it for their applications. <coughs> My slides? No slides. This is the other presentation, okay. So I continue. Um, we're a group of uh, eight um, people in the driving team. 
and a couple of hundred people in the mailing list and several hundred on the, um, the meetup that we form here in Barcelona. Um, in the first years, 2016 and 2017, um, we have organized several, many community gatherings to discuss together how we uh, can promote this community network and work together with the Givinet uh, Foundation to build on top of the um, network infrastructure that the Givinet community is already building. So what we have done then is um, find places where Givinet has an antenna and put uh, a LoRa gateway next to it so that we can transmit uh, receive the data from the sensors and send it over the uh, GiffyNet infrastructure to the internet. So that's what. Yeah, this is very good. Okay, thanks. No, this is Commons Cloud. This is the other one. Okay, no stop. Okay, so uh, and then in the last year we have done a um, pilot program with support from the municipality of Barcelona, where we um, found we worked on three levels. First, the deployment of the network. Second, uh, building capacity. We have organized like 30 training sessions, technical trainings, and as well in the third level, social uh, workshops to identify the needs from the social organizations and connect it to the opportunities that the Internet of Things in a community fashion is bringing. So then we have organized some hackathons to uh, build on prototypes for uh, energy monitoring, uh, pollution monitoring, um, mobility, tracking of assets, well, lots of different kinds of use cases. And we have built these three uh, activities <clears throat> together with local partners here in the city. So I'm not able to show you the picture, uh, but here in the city we have a network of 32 antennas that are active today, of which 12 we have built up through the pilot program with foster parents. So we, had, we have padrinas, so different organizations like the CSIC, the research council in the city, they have uh, contributed to uh, have us set up an antenna. Uh, the same, the Fab Lab Barcelona, uh, the Fundació Para Manel, a whole range of organizations have contributed to this so that we could um, extend the network in their neighborhoods. And now this year we are, we have joined uh, an existing cooperative, a recent cooperative, which I and some of us were already part of, the Fempo Comuns, Fempo Comuns Cooperative. Uh, which is a commons-oriented uh, cooperative multi-stakeholder where users and workers come together and where we try to consolidate uh, the, the community network of the, of the Things Network Catalonia. We call it the uh, CHOIC as well, the Xarxa Uberta y Comunitaria del Internet de las Cosas, the Open Community Network of the Internet of Things. So now we continue working on the, these three lines of work, the deployment of the network, the uh, building of capacity and uh, so that people learn about these technologies and get empowered and can do everything themselves if they want and work in teams to get around shared challenges. And then on the third level to build use cases. We are working with municipalities to uh, build on local groups in their, uh, in their cities um, so th these are the challenges. You can join us in ttn.cat. Uh, uh, there's also the international uh, website, thethingsnetwork.org, uh, where you can find the Barcelona community. And uh, you can find us at fempocommuns.coop uh, and then go to the CHOIC. <clears throat> this was about the Internet of Things. And I'm going to talk to you about the cloud as well, the Commons cloud, and maybe the thing that is shared, that both projects share uh, this worry about um, proprietary platforms eating up our data on our private lives, right? So where the, things, uh, the Internet of Things is an opportunity uh, for us to share resources, to to track our resources and to gain conscience and awareness about what 
uh, we are doing with our physical resource and energy in the world and, con and pollution, uh, it's at the same time a very uh, serious threat where people are losing out their, <coughs> uh, their private lives to big corporations if we not organize it our ourselves, right? <coughs> I have it here, the tracker. Yeah. That was good. I was just preparing to start off for that one. Okay. Estaba. Um, so, at the same time, in the area of clouds, and then I'm going to talk about the Commons Cloud now, um, in a second, we'll have the slides back. Um, there, we share the same worry, right? Where big capitalist platforms like Google, Amazon, Facebook, this is okay. Well, I could show you this inside our cloud as well, but today we're showing it in uh, another private cloud. Uh, can I not download it or something? Well, whatever. If we can show the presentation. Show the presentation. So the... <coughs> ah, yeah, that would be good. Just get it in the old-fashioned PDF format again. Control F sync. Vale. So Commons Cloud is a project that we run together with, uh, we co-produce with four, six organizations. Fempo Comuns, Collectic, Bitactic and Jamgo are four cooperatives. And Eurotic is a group of uh, freelancers working for free software and the Free Knowledge Institute who uh, convened this group uh, in, the, in the year 2017 to work together on this uh, threat uh, of private cloud platforms. And we are now co-producing this uh, under the roof of Fempo Commons as the multi-stakeholder cooperative where we um, share the responsibility between these six organizations. And at the same time, the users of our cloud services are becoming now uh, owners, co-owners, members, soci, socias from the cloud. We organize in six, four working groups currently, uh, development and operations, sustainability strategy, uh, support channels and documentation and communication and training. And in 2018, we started with a crowdfunding campaign at Goteo, what uh, <coughs> Olivier uh, works at. And um, we had 113 people and 10 organizations contributing to our crowdfunding campaign, what was the starting point to make this alive. And then this year, we got the support from the municipality of Barcelona and from several uh, organizations who wanted this cloud to be and to use these services. So why are we doing this because of these business models of these uh, private capitalistic uh, algorithmic platforms like Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and Apple, and Microsoft, and others, of course, who are just eating up our right to privacy, basically. Because the right of privacy is that a user can choose whether or not to share his or her data, right? And if you're sharing with in any of these platforms, you're just accepting to share your data with their um, publishers and uh, advertisers, and of course, through the espionage backdoors with the governments who are uh, centralized, our organizing, uh, automatically generated profiles. <coughs> so we thought we had to do something about this. We have four uh, foundational uh, principles that I go through with you. The first is, this is about open and common cooperativism. We ask the people to become, the users to become co-owners and get one vote in the General Assembly. And of course, one account. With one account, they can connect to the different services. What we build is a commons on different levels. In the software level, but also as the community co-owning the resource. We work, we 
our focus is on privacy, as I said before. We're not exploiting uh, for third parties any of your personal data or user profiles. Uh, everything what we make is based on free software and what we add to it, we make available again uh, as free software. <clears throat> and we are using the best free software available in the different domains that our users have needs. We work on decentralization, that's a key vision uh, on different levels. One level is that the collectives who participate in the Commons Cloud, they can self-manage their user base within the Commons Cloud. So you go to the user account, uh, the account management software, what we built, and there uh, the collectives, they can uh, can have an, an onboarding process to allow the people that are their user base to be part of this and give them access to their services within the Commons Cloud Realm. And then on the other hand, we work on the interconnection between replicas of what we're building. So what is it then what we're offering? Right now, we have three services. The first is the Office, La Oficina, is a, an, an, a platform where people can store their files and organize them in folders. If they want, they can share them with groups or just with uh, other users or with people who don't have a user account. They have um, and contact details, calendars, synchronize it with the mobile, um, synchronize it with your laptop. You have always all the data with you and access to them if you want to. The second service is the project management project management platform. It's a platform where you can have tasks, organize them in uh, co different columns like to do, doing, done, like the agile methodologies, uh, and a range of applications that support teams to work together online in a network fashion. Then the third service that we have in beta now is the online forum software called Discourse, where we offer as Agora. It's in the Agora where the community gets together, can discuss, can take decisions together. And all this is glued together with uh, the account management software, which is based on LDAP, which basically all, well, many, most mature software platforms uh, use that standard so that uh, we can give access to our users to the different platforms that they want to. Now, key is, of course, participation. How can you participate? We have two levels, individual users and collectives. The individual users, they can have their Commons Cloud account for free, for all, always, in eternity. But then can, they can um, access the community services, which is the Agora and projects right now. Um, and they can uh, participate in existing projects and in uh, discussions. And there is this uh, service, the office, which is uh, where we require a monthly or periodic contribution. People become a co-owner for 10 euro contribution once to the social capital and then uh, pay a service fee according to their needs. And the, the co collectives, <coughs> they have access to the account management software and they can choose to have different dedicated services, like a dedicated office, for example. We have several organizations who have that running right now, and they have the same schemes uh, to become a member, but then pay a different service fee, uh, starting at 30 euros a month. So we ask you to join this uh, struggle together, take the leap, go to commonscloud.co, Fezal Sal. Hello, everyone. So my name is Pau. Uh, I'm representing here today a project named uh, Bok Doni. And Bok Doni is a Esperanto word, which means to give boys. Okay. So that's, that's our mission. We want to empower people by giving them boys. What it means? For us, uh, the first milestone we want to achieve is the governance. So the voting, 
So we are very, very focused right now on this layer. We understand that there are many other layers that the society needs for being uh, empowered and to have voice, but that's the first one we want to, to try to solve. So um, what makes us a, a bit different from the existing uh, solutions related with uh, voting and uh, governance is that uh, we want we want to make a new kind of voting right now i would say digital voting works for small groups of people where there is some trust so for instance if you use some i don't know doodle okay you make you can use doodle for making a uh, 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 an election, a small election, but you have to trust Doodle, and you have to trust the administrator who created Doodle. So at the end, if you have trust in your in your community, then you can use any kind of system. It works. But what happens when there is no trust? You can imagine something like a city like Barcelona or a country like uh, Catalonia. Uh, how can you be sure that your vote has been counted and it represents yourself? That's where all the current system failed, in my opinion. So um, in St Estonia, for instance, which is like the, probably the most advanced country in Europe uh, regarding the digital voting, you still have to trust the government and the government could cheat on you. So. Our focus goes on fixing this problem. And how can we do that? So there is something which is called uh, a blockchain. You probably heard about it. Uh, you probably heard about Bitcoin, but we have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Blockchain, at the end, is a way to get distributed consensus. So you can have consensus on that a vote is valid or is not valid. So blockchain help us to fix this issue. And in addition, it is distributed. So there are no central points, there are no central authorities. Anyone uh, participating in a blockchain uh, works the same way and plays the same role. So we're using blockchain, but only for very small things, the minimum possible just to get the consensus. Then we just, we're using something which is called, uh, I'm not following my script, <laughs> so, uh, which is called zero knowledge proof. And that's something amazing. And this only exists since, I would say two or three years ago. The zero knowledge proof is a cryptographic technique that allows you to prove something without revealing what you're trying to prove, your proof. So you can prove that you are in a list of valid users without revealing which user you are in that list. That's a very kind of crazy idea, but it works and it's correct from the mathematical point of view. So this allows us to put a board in a blockchain demonstrating that I'm part of a list without telling anyone else that I'm this on the, on, on the list. And this will be transparent because the trust is on the mathematics, is on the cryptography. So anyone from the world will be able to validate that my vote was correct. And I will also be able to follow my vote and to check that actually it was uh, counted. So to me, it allows a new kind of democracy. I, I think that's a personal opinion that democracy currently works on small groups, but not in big groups. This is why we have something called representative government, which is not democracy. Um, so enable the, with this kind of new technology that we have right now, I think we can have the first era of true democracy for big groups in the world. Okay? Yeah, that sounds very epic, but I really think it's, it's, it's true. I mean, we're working for this. This is our vision. This is what we want to achieve. 
uh, in addition to that, we have very strong principles. I have here in my script to not forget anyone. Yes, privacy first. Uh, we want to be anti-censorship, so that's because if you are if you are not resilient, then a third party which want to block your election will be able to destroy it. So you are not uh, self-sovereign in, in this case. Uh, security for the user, so uh, distributed, open and free. Everything must be open source and free software. So anyone can check the code. Anyone can make his own modifications of the code. Uh, we want to achieve scalability. That's something also hard when you're thinking about 10, 15, 20 million of people using at the same time a system. You need to be very sure what you're doing. And we want to make it very easy for the end user. We want to make it something normal. So normal as when you are in the bus, you are checking your Twitter or your Facebook, and you're reading the news, and maybe you are uh, participating somehow in this social network. We want to make the same, but for voting. Why? You could stay in the bus and reading about proposals and voting about them, for instance. no. So we, we, we want to make it very, very easy for the end user and very yeah, and easy to understand to participate on all these processes. And we want to make democracy as anything we do in our lives every day, not something that we do every four years. No? So here we can enable also liquid democracy, di direct democracy, demo democratic confederalism. We can enable any kind of new uh, political and, and, and economic and social systems, we are a piece of this. So that's we want we want to do. Um, yeah, we we start this project two years ago. Uh, we spent almost one year just designing the project, making our research, talking with people, experts, blah blah blah. We make some initial uh, prototypes. They work it fine. So in the second year we have been developing and putting hands on the keyboard. So now we are very, very close to have the first uh, release of uh, our platform. And I hope in the next uh, months or maybe weeks, we will be able to release the first um, app. It will be an Android and iOS app at the end, but also web and stuff like this. And we will, you will be able uh, yeah, so you will be able to test it and to use it and to give us feedback. So if you want afterwards, we are we would like to get your emails or whatever who is interested on, on being a beta tester of this platform. And we will be very happy to, to have you into account. Okay, that's it. Okay, my turn. Um, it's just the website and we'll be okay. Do you hear me okay? Yes? Yeah, I'm from the Giffinet uh, Foundation. It must mention it, actually, it's a, it's a pleasure to be in a panel like that because there is a lot of synergies in, in, in that. And actually, rather than talk much about Giffinet, I'm interested in to talk about the opportunity that enables and because well let's start by Giffinet. Giffinet we started building and our collective action is about building infrastructures for getting connected to the internet. More closer. You know if you go 15 years back and still in many places in the world still half of the world is not connected right and if you went to rural areas maybe you didn't had an option for getting service for getting connected to the internet so that motivated to some of us to build the infrastructures for getting connected, and it's really what we did. But also there, uh, there was another mo motivation for joining that, I mean, for not depending on the corporations for getting access to the internet and doing the things by yourself. That can, can be also happen in the cities, right? And one analogy that describes it very much is what I 
say the, the espresso coffee. Uh, everybody understands that you can do an espresso coffee either from your home or you can go to a local shop or you can go to a Starbucks. Uh, you have all those options, but you don't have, the only option is not to go only to Starbucks. Is what I mean, is to uh, make people understand that telecommunication is have to be like an espresso that can be done in all those three options and not only by large companies. Is that easy? The, the, the concept is actually what we do. And right now, um, and just to give you an example, a few blocks from here, there is the interchange in Barcelona, uh, where the interchange happens for the whole internet here in Catalonia. We joined it there 10 years ago, and of course at that point we were the smaller uh, player then joining in that, in that facility. Uh, 10 years after, we are the bigger. Uh, so it's possible, it can be done, we, we did. We are connecting right now uh, more than 100,000 people in a daily basis and you know, watching Netflix using fiber optics, Wi-Fi and, uh, and everything. Actually, we are the bigger because the incumbents that play, they don't like to change the, the transit locally and they do from other sites. So we are not the biggest. Uh, the, the biggest still are the, the, the incumbents. But it is real, we did and actually what we did uh, at Gifinet. And, but the highlight that I would like to say is uh, it's not uh, a miracle. It's something that can be done and can be done worldwide to connect the next billion people that are still unconnected. So it cannot happen only in, in Catalonia. And that uh, could be a way for connecting everyone, like an espresso. So you don't have to... Well, maybe when you are abroad and if you don't like that black water that some people call coffee, you know, the American coffee, and you enjoy when you find a Starbucks and then you can take a real coffee. But you can still uh, make a coffee by your own, a uh, very good brewer. And it's that simple as a concept. But there is another, well, actually, in telecommunications is a bit more difficult, that you cannot do alone. Then you have to do in a community, community way. So that the other side of doing this is to make that network not just as a private asset, but as a common good. So the network that we build is, uh, is in commons. And that's the other, let's say, DNA factor that we have in the very beginning. To make it possible for make a, 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 a billion of small things to create a big thing, you need to put all the efforts together, and so it makes sense to do it in a, in a community and, and uh, make the network happen as a commons, not as a private asset of a, of a company. So those are the two aspects, let's say, which are key in a project like Coast, and that's, that's it. It's not more complex than that. And for happening that second thing, which is the commons, then it's very well connected to all other panelists that have been talked before, because we have to talk about uh, voting, participation, governance, data that has to make public and something very on. And that's why I enjoy to be in a panel like that, because uh, when talking about collective action, we are very specific in terms of building infrastructure for connecting internet, but all the other aspects actually matters on making this, this happen. And that's it. Hola, hola, sorry. We've got five minutes uh, according to the schedule in which we can make questions. If any of you have any question, um, I have one question. Maybe I'm too selfish, but I would like to know the answer. I think this is mainly for Bogdani. Uh, I think that we, to me, it's amazing because uh, we haven't talked about this real decreto thing in the whole, in the whole, in the whole session or in the whole sharing cities action panels and i think that this is a very relevant question we, we need to we need to ask ourselves and we need to organize collectively to do something about it because uh, i think it's very related to the voting process and to i mean blockchain finally had a very concrete use for everyone for a population uh, in catalonia and and suddenly this is uh, has been banned um, my question is, what do you think, 
I mean, what do you think blockchain and, 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 and the voting processes are regarding this new wave of uh, conservative uh, uh, law application? I mean, can happen. And, and secondly, I mean, I would like to also uh, ask the rest of the panelists if uh, um, the collective, the commons, is under threat. Because this is a first step, it's a very serious one, and maybe the door has opened and maybe other commons can be banned too. So this is my, this is the question for you and then for the rest of you. Okay, so I will start. Uh, yeah, this law, this Real Decreto is, is horrible <laughs> and it, it doesn't fit in Europe, so I don't think it will be, they will be able to, to keep it uh, with the time, but let's see. The problem, the main problem is that they attack directly the internet, the infrastructure of the internet. So they talking about they can just stop internet for a while, and without any yeah, from it's a government decision. So not not any of our platforms, open platforms, would work if there is no internet. So in this case, I think something like Giphynet, for instance, make a lot of work. Is the only way we have to survive to this to this censorship. Yeah, of course, and it's like a joke, that Real Decreto, but the sad, the sad side of the story is that it's not a joke, it's there. <laughs> I mean, it's a joke uh, because in the current context of Europe, you know, uh, giving the right of the government to, to, to intercept the communications without a judiciary order, without the basic guarantees, uh, I mean, it's something that is scary. It happened in other countries, so it's very sad. And that's the sad part, it really happens. And the, the, the bad thing is that was already happening before the Real Decreto. So all of us must be aware that on the 1st of October and uh, in September uh, 2017, so it happened at many times and it's still happening. Was happening with the tsunami, for instance, before the Real Decreto, without the Real Decreto. So the sad part is that it happens and it's real. And that's the scary part. It's a joke because, of course, that will not survive it's against common sense and in the long term. And that, to happen that, that Real Decreto, for something that they were already doing, the only explanation that I can find is that uh, because the uh, Spanish elections was more uh, because of the elections. Uh, the, the good thing is that in the long term, those things crazy hopefully will be, will be gone. Yeah, I think um, that law but in more in general, the commons and the digital commons is on the one hand thriving and on the other hand very much threatened. So it's thriving and we will route around those uh, legal barriers, right? Um, we set up all kinds of virtual private networks to connect to websites outside of the Spanish jurisdiction, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, so we can route around it. But still, the threat is there that uh, we have these kind of policymakers. We have uh, political campaigns buying into um, companies like Cambridge Analytica and the successors now that that company doesn't exist anymore eh, well, to uh, influence political elections. Uh, and we, every time, more and more people are depending on these kind of uh, proprietary cloud algorithmic, algorithmic capitalism infrastructures. So the threat is seriously there. If maybe we are still in time to keep some form of freedom, but I'm not completely optimistic. To be very short, I think next year we'll be here and then we'll, we'll be able to say a real decreto. A muerto. Surely, because anyway, all the European policies are just like saying the contrary, and all the public European funds are going in the direction of blockchain. So basically, this is basically local, uh, crazy digital violence on participation. It's not only about Real Decreto, it's about all these participation platforms which are set up, which are by means of the law of participation, which are locals, you have to really, really look, uh, look at it because that's our, basically our code to participate, talking about code. This doesn't, um, um, doesn't mean that our protection, uh, our, our participation is still protected because there's many decisions which have just disappeared. 
So internet is still there, but just like an institution has said, like, get the connection. We don't want, you know, we don't really, we, this is about like privacy and participation. So respect the way I've been participating. So my vote shouldn't disappear or be manipulated or just like disappear. It's even worse than being manipulated, I guess. So, uh, I don't know if any of you wants to ask anything. This is the moment. We've got five more minutes, maybe. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the IDEN3 uh, system of Jordi, uh, how that relates to what you were working on. Oh, I hate microphones and cameras as well, um, and uh, Real Decreto. Um, um, I'm wondering if you could tell me about the relationship between the um, self sovereign identity that you're proposing and the IDEN3 system of Jordi de Bellinoso. So we work in close with, with IDEN3 and the identity that we are proposing for our system is mainly the standard which is being developed by IDEN3. Hello, hello, oh, no, sorry. So we're finished. Thank you very much, panelists, for your sharing your knowledge. Thank you.